They thought she would never be found. Surely the fire had done its job. But the irony was that the very means they thought they could use to cover up their horrendous crime would be exactly what exposed them. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 147, The Murder of Debbie Fenter. Today's episode is brought to you by Dialabed, South Africa's largest branded bedding retailer. We all know that getting a great night's sleep makes us happier and healthier, so Dialabed is on a mission to make it as easy as possible for you. Shop at 76 stores nationwide or online at dialabed.co.za. A huge thank you to Dialabed for supporting True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming. And for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Anri Olifia, Ben Fairbrother, Zumi Jongwe, Monica Urquhart, Teresa Ho, and Paul Freeth. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout-out on the pod, and other exclusive contents, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. This week's case gives me a similar feeling to the murder of Marie Favet. The idea that a vulnerable person can be brutally murdered by someone who's supposed to care for them. This case horrified everyone when it happened. The world was confined to their homes during the COVID lockdown when the victim disappeared and her friends simply couldn't fathom that she would just vanish, especially under the circumstances. There's something brutally cold about this case, notwithstanding the story told by the murderer, which, as you'll hear, doesn't seem to ring true. In researching this case, I used an episode of Heis Knut Vara Levenstramas, social media sources, and several media articles. So, let's get into episode 147, The Murder of Debbie Fenter. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Debbie Fenter was born on the 24th of May, 1968. Her parents divorced when she was in her early teens and her mom remarried and had another daughter with her new husband. There was quite a big age difference between Debbie and her half-sister, Danita, 
with Danita being born when Debbie was 13, but Debbie was happy being a big sister. Sadly, the two girls lost their mom when Danita was just seven years old and Debbie 20. Later, Danita would claim that their mother had passed away as a result of a painkiller addiction. Debbie did her best to look after her little sister. It seems that the child's father was also not present, although there's no solid explanation as to whether he had also died or simply left the family. For months, young Debbie, really just a youngster herself, tried to care for Danita to ensure she didn't go into the foster system. Eventually, though, Debbie had to admit that she was simply too young to take responsibility for the child, and Danita bounced between extended family members before eventually being adopted when she was 11 years old. Debbie tried to stay in touch with her little sister, but it was difficult once she was adopted, and soon the pair grew apart, and time took their lives on different roads. When Danita matriculated and turned 18, she and Debbie got in touch again. By then, Debbie was well established in her own life, and hoped to be able to help her sister too, so she offered her a job at her small business. Danita worked with Debbie for a while, but she soon met the man she would go on to marry, Kat van Rijn, and they moved out of the East Rand where Debbie lived and worked, and the sisters lost touch again. Debbie herself doesn't appear to have ever been married, and she didn't have any children of her own. She focused on her work and on her pastimes and interests, and had a large circle of close friends. Debbie's social media accounts show that she was well-loved by those who knew her. She didn't have much family to speak of besides Danita, who she often lost contact with, but her biological father and his wife were still in her life, and they did spend time together. Debbie had a biological brother born to her mom when her parents were still together, and he sadly passed away from a heart attack in the mid-2000s. Debbie stepped up to support his sons during that time, always willing to give her love and care to those she felt needed it. When Danita met Gert van Rijn, the pair quickly fell in love and married. Those who knew the couple said they'd watched them go from both being employed at really good jobs and living in a lovely large house to both being unemployed and living in a small cottage on a property in Bronkospreit. No one really knew what had caused the downfall. Most assumed it was simply one of those things. Both, unfortunately, losing their jobs at the same time, struggling to keep up with the cost of living. But there seemed to be more to it. But it would only be revealed later. Somewhere along the line, Danita had developed a drug habit. The nature of her addiction isn't really discussed anywhere, but it seems that she veered between being a daily user to a weekend user and back again. This is possibly another reason why the relationship between Debbie and Danita had ebbed and waned. It's not uncommon for people with substance use disorders to move in and out of their families' lives. In 2019, Debbie received a devastating diagnosis. She had cervical cancer, and it was already at a very advanced stage. At first, Debbie pushed back and tried every treatment she could find. Chemotherapy, alternative treatments, anything she could get her hands on in the hopes that she could fight the cancer and extend her life. As Debbie told her friends, she was not ready to die. She still had lots of things she wanted to do. Sadly, as hard as Debbie fought, the cancer continued to overtake her body, and as 2020 started, she recognised that she had to make some plans for care. 
Debbie had withered down to just 42 kilograms and was in severe pain a lot of the time. She'd been given morphine and other pain management capsules for this. Debbie had tried to continue working as long as she could, but soon realised she couldn't do it anymore. She had a small policy in place which would pay her out a lump sum in the event that she could no longer work due to illness, and she made the decision to activate this so that it could pay out. The payment she would get was not massive at all, just 86,000 rand, so she knew it wasn't going to last very long, and she would have to be very careful with the money. Debbie also recognised that she needed someone else to cook and clean for her. She had her own vehicle, an old white Ford Escort, but driving was also becoming increasingly difficult. Despite being an incredibly independent person, Debbie relented, and on the 6th of February 2020, she posted the following on Facebook. Quote, Hi, I am urgently looking for a place or someone to take me in. I have advanced cervix cancer already spread to the colon. It's basically to see that I have three meals to eat every day and that my washing can be done once a week. Anywhere in the East Rand. Can't afford much, but it's negotiable. Please inbox me. Debbie. End quote. On this post, several of Debbie's friends commented saying that they couldn't offer a place, but they would help her look for an affordable care facility. Some just sent well wishes. It would emerge, though, that someone else had seen this Facebook post and reached out to Debbie. Danita van Rijn had seemingly not realised that her half-sister was as ill as she was. The two had been going through another period of not really communicating, but this Facebook post caused Danita to reach out. She told Debbie that she could come and live with her and her husband, Gert, on the small holding they lived on in Bronkospreit. Danita said that Debbie had done so much to care for her when she was a child that she wanted to repay her in her time of need. The arrangement seemed perfect. Debbie was quite excited to be able to spend more time with Danita and relieved that she would no longer be alone and could rely on someone to help her with her needs. At first, there wasn't much urgency involved in getting Debbie to Danita's house, but in March 2020, when it was announced that South Africa would be locking down to prevent the spread of COVID-19, the situation suddenly changed overnight, and Debbie had no choice but to very quickly pack up and move so that she didn't get locked down alone. Debbie's friends stayed in contact with her on WhatsApp and Facebook, and although they couldn't visit because of the risk of giving Debbie COVID and the lockdown restrictions which were in place, they communicated regularly, and they said Debbie seemed happy living with Danita and Gert. In April, just a month after she'd moved in, Debbie shared a photo of Danita and Gert on her Facebook profile, expressing her gratitude to the couple for caring for her. Of course, Debbie was contributing to the household expenses in exchange for her living there, and considering both Danita and Gert were unemployed, this money certainly would have been very welcome. Although externally the arrangement seemed to be going well for all concerned, behind the scenes it seemed that things were not all that rosy between the sisters. It seems Debbie had discovered that Danita was using drugs and was not happy with the situation. On the other side of the fence, Debbie had her own pain medication, morphine and other substances which had been prescribed to her by her doctors, and Danita would later claim that she felt that Debbie was abusing this medication. Now, firstly, I don't think it's possible for a stage 4 cancer sufferer to abuse pain medication. 
I mean, yes, technically it is possible, but is it really even an issue? The reality was that Debbie did not have long to live. And if she wanted to make that time as pain-free as possible, and she had the means to reduce the pain she was in, why on earth would she not do that? And why wouldn't her sister want that for her? I can understand the fear that the person may overdose, but Debbie was, by all accounts, very level-headed. And her friend said that she actually didn't like the way the pain meds made her feel. So when they had been around her, she'd actually taken them as little as possible, only when she really needed it. So although Danita claimed that this was the reason that she was trying to get Debbie to let her manage her pain meds on her behalf, considering Danita had a hard drug habit, I cannot help but think that this concern was more about Danita getting her hands on her sister's morphine than anything else. Of course, this has never been proven, but besides actually taking the morphine herself, Danita could very well have been selling it. Morphine would have gone for a pretty decent price if she sold it, especially considering everyone was locked down and many substance users were struggling to get their hands on their ordinary fixes. Debbie did not mention this issue over medication to anyone. It would only come out later, so sadly, we only have Danita's version to go on. In May 2020, Debbie would be celebrating her 52nd birthday on the 24th. Danita apparently wanted to arrange a bra for the occasion, but soon realised that lockdown restrictions wouldn't allow for this. It probably also wasn't a great idea to have a large group of people gathering around Debbie, who was extremely vulnerable from a health perspective. The idea was canned, and Debbie spent her birthday alone with Danita and Gert. On her Facebook page, People shared messages saying happy birthday, but there were no responses. Soon, friends shared messages saying that they had sent her a message on WhatsApp to wish her a happy birthday, but she hadn't responded there either. On the 31st of May 2020, at 1.30am in the morning, Gert van Rijn walked into the police station near his home. He told the officer on duty that he wanted to report his sister-in-law, Debbie Fenter, as missing. In Kat's initial statement, he claimed that he, his wife and Debbie had been out on the 29th of May and they'd gone to a nearby petrol station. When he and his wife had gone into the convenience store at the station, leaving Debbie in the car, Debbie had locked the car and driven away, and she hadn't returned. He said that Debbie had been wearing her pyjamas at the time. When the dockets arrived on the table of the investigating officer, Warrant Officer Gerda Tuasen, the next day, she immediately found the case to be a little odd. She acknowledges that the SAPS will always approach the case of a missing adult, with a little wariness at first, especially if it's reported that the individual may have left of their own volition. But Twisson really felt that the story around Debbie leaving didn't add up. She called Gert back into the station and interviewed him again. She immediately noticed that pieces of the story he gave her in that interview were different to what he'd claimed when he opened the missing persons case. She asked a colleague to interview Danita. When Danita van Rijn came into the police station, she had an A4 diary with her. As she sat down in front of the officer and they began to ask her questions, she started writing. The officer asked her what she was writing down and she said that she was in the habit of writing everything down and she just wanted to make sure she did everything she could to help find her sister. 
What immediately stood out from this interview and from Gertz was that their stories pretty much lined up, up until the point that they were at the petrol station. Both claimed that Debbie had locked the car when they arrived at the petrol station and driven away, but when Tursen and her colleague asked each what had happened after that, the answers quickly diverged. Kat said that he'd called a friend, and that man had given them a lift home, but no, he didn't have that guy's number on him. Danita had a much more involved story. She said that they'd taken a taxi, for which they'd paid 18 rand, to Mamelodi Crossing. Then they'd hitched a lift with a stranger to the dirt road that led to the small holding on which they lived, and they'd walked that three-kilometre road home. Danita had said that they'd done many things that day before Debbie had disappeared. They'd woken up around 10am and then gone to Silverton to get car parts for their vehicle, going to many different establishments. Then they went to Mamelodi Hospital to get some more medication for Debbie and several other places. Eventually, they had arrived at the petrol station, where Debbie had abandoned them and disappeared. Twisson figured out that if they'd visited all of those places, and then still had to find their own way home, given that it was a winter's day, they would have been walking that dirt road home in the dark. She asked Denita if that had been the case. And she said, oh no, it had still been daylight. Tursen did not think this was possible. Another part of Denita's story that flagged for Tursen was the fact that Denita claimed Debbie had insisted on driving her own vehicle. The woman was incredibly ill, and mostly bedridden, and warrant officer Tursen simply couldn't imagine that she would insist on driving the couple all around Silverton, Mamelodi, and everywhere else Denita claimed they'd gone. One of the first places Warrant Officer Tursen had gone after receiving the docket was to the petrol station Gert had said Debbie was last seen at. She had a description of Debbie's vehicle and the registration number and she went through the CCTV recordings for the day in question. But she didn't see any sign of Kat, Denita, Debbie, or the white Ford Escort. So when Denita was in for an interview, she was asked if she was absolutely sure that it was this petrol station they'd been at. Denita immediately said yes, she knew it was, she remembered it well because when they'd driven in, someone had cut in in front of Gert and he'd sworn at the man and made a scene. So, Gert was driving, Tuerson thought. What happened to Debbie wouldn't let them drive her car? In the days after Debbie Fencer was reported missing, her missing persons flyer was distributed widely on social media. Many of her friends actually discovered that she was missing by seeing the flyer. They were shocked at the allegation that Debbie had left of her own accord. They simply couldn't fathom it. But perhaps she just wanted some time away, and maybe after that she'd been hijacked, and that's why she hadn't returned home. On the 1st of June, Denita van Rijn posted on Debbie's Facebook page from her own profile. I've translated the following message from Afrikaans to English. It reads, quote, Debbie, if you see this message on your wall, please just react to it. It is completely unacceptable that you've turned your back on those who loved, cared for you and supported you. We all love you so much. Please just let someone know you're okay or answer your phone. I have personally phoned you more than seven times, and each time it either goes to voicemail or you decline the call. Please, my sister, I'm begging you. End quote. The entire message is typed in capital letters. Each sentence on its own line, and each line 
with multiple exclamation or question marks behind it. In the comments on the post, initially at least, Debbie's friends chime in, agreeing and begging Debbie to get in touch. Some mention they're shocked that Debbie would worry everyone like this. But soon, the tone of the comments and reactions changes. From disbelief and concern to abject horror and rage. Although there'd been no sign of Debbie's vehicle on the CCTV at the petrol station on the 29th, other cameras in the area around the small holding, which investigators had looked at, did pick up the vehicle, and Gert and Danita, but no Debbie. On the 29th, 30th and 31st of May, both Gert and Danita were seen using Debbie's white Ford Escort. On several occasions during that time, Gert is seen walking to the boot of the vehicle, looking around, popping it open, staring inside, and then shutting it again. This was ultimate proof that the pair were lying about the circumstances of Debbie's disappearance, but the investigators needed much more information before they could move. Using a network of informants, they were able to identify a man who was known for purchasing stolen vehicles in the area. The man admitted that he'd purchased a white Ford Escort from a man he identified as Gert from a photograph. By that time, the vehicle had already been sold several more times, but the police were able to track it down to a man who was stripping it for parts in Shoshangube. With another large piece of the puzzle acquired, investigators who'd put in a Section 205 request on Debbie's bank account received those statements. They showed that in the days after Debbie had disappeared, the 86,000 rand that had been deposited from her policy had been transferred out of her account and into Gert van Rijn's account. Then Section 205s were taken out for Danita and Gert's accounts, this showed the money arriving in Gert's account and being split in half, with half going to Danita van Rijn's account. Now, the police had motive. Police were also able to find Debbie's cell phone, which had also been sold to a known criminal. This man said that he'd received the phone from a woman but couldn't identify her. Over the course of June 2020, police ran down all of these leads methodically. They also called Denita and Gert in for questioning several more times. Denita always came in with her diary and once even brought a bunch of flowers for the officers working on her sister's case to show how grateful she was. Despite her apparent gratitude and her activity on Facebook, Danita had not shared her sister's missing person poster even once. For the most part, the investigators kept a lot of the evidence they were finding under their hats, not wanting to play their hand before they had everything they needed. Toward the end of June, Warrant Officer Tuerson arranged to meet Gert and Danita at their home. The appointment was made for 9am, but when the team arrived... The Van Rains were nowhere to be seen. The owner of the property said the pair had left early that morning. Getting the couple on the phone proved a challenge, but eventually Danita answered and apologised for not being there. She claimed they'd had a last-minute job interview come through and they'd had to go to that. Their absence, though, could work in investigators' favour and Tuerson asked the owner of the property if she could have his written permission to access the rooms in which the Van Rains lived. The owner agreed. When they entered the premises, the owner was shocked at how clean the house was. He said he'd expressed concern to the Van Rains before about how dirty and unkempt their house was. 
The last he'd seen, there were piles of junk stacked around that you had to climb over to get around the house. But now, the home was spotless, scrubbed down. You could almost eat off the floor if you'd wanted to. The owner showed the officers the room in which he knew Debbie had slept. The room was bare, though. It was as though she'd never been there. Only one set of pyjamas sat in a drawer and some old medication with Debbie's name on it. But other than that, it seemed the Fun Rains had very quickly been happy to get rid of everything Debbie owned. Almost as though they didn't hold out any hope she'd be coming back. The investigators also struck gold in, in the rubbish bin at the house, The refuse at the small holding was not collected as regularly as at suburban homes, so there was quite a bit more to sift through. In the bin, police found a pile of torn-up paper. The paper looked similar to the diary Danita had brought into each of her interviews. The pages had been torn into the tiniest of pieces, but police collected as many of the pieces as they could and they would spend the next few hours reassembling the pages. When they were finished, it became clear that Danita had been using the diary to keep track of her own answers, presumably so that she knew what she'd said and could say the same thing if she was asked again. Also on the pages was a money allocation of sorts. Looking at the amounts written on the page and comparing it to the amount that had come into Debbie's account, police realised that Danita had been planning what she was going to do with her half of the money from Debbie's account. With all of this evidence, even though Debbie had not yet been found, police were confident they could prosecute the pair, at the very least, for fraud and theft, and very likely for murder too. They felt sure that any judge would see that Debbie Fenter had been in no condition to run away and make a new life for herself elsewhere. Everything she owned had been left behind. All her money was taken out of her account. Her car and cell phone were sold. Debbie had not run away. She was dead, and her murderers were about to be called to task. On the 4th of July 2020, Danita and Kat van Rijn were arrested on charges of murder, theft, defeating the ends of justice, perjury and fraud. The news about the pair's arrest quickly spread, and Debbie's friends were horrified at the thought that their friend may have fallen victim to the hands who had committed to caring for her. In the days after the arrest, A fire spread through a felt in Valeria, Pretoria. Firefighters attended and put the fire out. They swept the area when it was safe to do so, trying to see if they could figure out where it had started, although it was likely just an accidental felt fire, which is not uncommon. During their search, though, the firefighters came across a deep cavern in the felt. In it, they spotted a large canvas bag which had mostly burned away, revealing the remains of a human body. Police were called and the remains were retrieved. Also in the ditch, they found a bag which had a pillow and a metal jug in it. The jug smelled of petrol and from the pattern of the burns, It was very clear that the body had not been burned in the felt fire. Rather, it had been burned before that. It appeared that whomever had put the victim there had thrown the bag containing the body into the ditch, poured petrol over it from the top of the ditch, and then thrown the bag with the pillow and the container into the ditch and set it alight. Initially, the body was believed to belong to a black male, 
But when the forensic pathologist went to perform an autopsy on the body, they discovered that it was in fact a white female. The victim had had her hands tied behind her back. The cause of death was found to be suffocation, and a plastic bag was believed to have been placed over the victim's face. Devastatingly, tiny fragments of plastic were found inside the victim's lungs, indicating that she was still breathing when the bag was placed over her face. The victim's face and much of her body were badly burned, so a visual identification was not going to be possible. But because the victim's hands had been tied behind her back and she happened to be placed in the hole in a sitting-up position, her body had protected parts of her hands from much of the heat of the fire. Just four of her fingertips were completely untouched by the flames, and that would be enough to identify her. Forensic pathologists were aware that police in Bronkospreit were searching for a missing 52-year-old white female who was believed to have last been seen wearing her pyjamas. Some material fragments found with and on the body looked like pyjama material to the pathologist, and so the first set of prints the victims were compared to were those of Debbie Fenter. Warrant Officer Tuerson was outside court, waiting to go into the bail hearings for Denita and Gert when her phone rang, and she received the news that Debbie Fenter's body had been found. She approached the prosecutor with the news, and although the accused couple would only hear the news after the hearing was finished, it would change everything. The case against the pair was already pretty solid, but it was clear that neither had thought Debbie's remains would ever be found, and when that was added, Denita decided to enter a guilty plea. Denita claimed that she and Debbie had been arguing over her medication because Denita was allegedly concerned Debbie was using too much morphine and Debbie had become incensed and attacked Denita. Denita claimed that she'd lost control and held a pillow over Debbie's face, and she soon realised that Debbie appeared to not be breathing. She said that she'd panicked and called Gert to help her. She said he'd wanted to phone an ambulance, but she'd convinced him not to and instead told him they should make Debbie's death look like a hijacking in which she'd been murdered by the hijackers. She claimed that this was why they tied her hands behind her back and put the plastic bag over her head. The pillow found in the bag was the one Denita said she'd used to suffocate Debbie. Debbie's DNA was found on the pillow, and the contusions on her face indicated that she had been suffocated in a way other than the plastic bag before that was placed over her head. Denita and Kjart, though, swore that they thought Debbie was dead when they put the plastic bag on her head. Kjart had then placed Debbie's body into a canvas bag and put her in the boot of the car. They'd purchased petrol in the container found in the bag and taken Debbie's body out to the felt, where they'd poured petrol over her and set her alight. Although it seemed clear that Denita was not telling the whole truth in her statement, the prosecution decided that they would accept her guilty plea. The judge did as well, and Denita van Rijn was sentenced to an effective 25 years in prison, and Gert van Rijn to 15 years for his role as an accessory. Situations like this are always difficult. And while I can understand why the prosecution would rather accept a 25-year sentence than risk Denita somehow getting off on the charges completely if they went to trial, it's difficult for me to feel that justice for Debbie was really done. Denita will be eligible for parole in 12 and a half years. 
despite the fact that she pled guilty. The main reason she was not given a life sentence was because the murder was not proven as premeditated. And maybe it wasn't entirely. But I do believe there is strong evidence to suspect it was. I'll just say that I put absolutely no stock in Danita's version of events. Firstly, there's a far greater chance that the alleged argument about Debbie's medication was because Debbie noticed her morphine was disappearing. I also definitely don't believe that Debbie physically attacked Danita. The woman had stage 4 cancer, was too weak to make food or do laundry for herself, and was in incredible pain. That's just undeniably nonsense. The money is the key as far as I'm concerned. Danita had made very little effort to be in contact with her older sister. When Debbie posted on Facebook, she clearly mentioned that she could pay at least something toward her keep. And while I don't think that the small monthly amount was the reason Danita killed her sister, I don't think it's any coincidence that her murder happened so soon after her policy payouts cleared in her account. Danita was already planning how she was going to spend the money in her diary. For me at least, this is clear evidence of premeditation to some extent. Many people think that suffocating someone to death is a simple task, and as I've said before in other episodes, Many killers are surprised when their victims regain consciousness. Someone may lose consciousness quite quickly after they're deprived of oxygen, but this is the body's way of protecting the brain from damage, and they're not dead after this initial period of unconsciousness. This is why you'll often see suffocation or strangulation combined with another more violent method of murder. The victim regains consciousness, surprises the killer, and they react with the first means they have at hand to silence them forever. Denise claims that she and Kat didn't know Debbie wasn't dead after she suffocated her with the pillow, and they'd only placed the bag over her head to fake the hijacking gone wrong scenario. I personally don't believe this. I do think that Denita had initially thought Debbie was dead, but I also think that she regained consciousness while the couple were deciding how to dispose of her remains, and Denita, or Khat, or both, placed the plastic bag over her head and tied her hands behind her back so that she couldn't remove the bag. I believe They knew very well that Debbie was still breathing when they put her into that canvas bag. This is likely why there is footage of of Khat occasionally looking into the boot while they were very possibly driving around with Debbie in there. He was getting paranoid that she was going to regain consciousness again and wanted to reassure himself that she was dead. Considering Debbie went quiet around her birthday, the 24th of May, some wonder when she was actually killed. And added to that, whether she really was as happy as she claimed during those two months, or if she was just keeping the peace because she had no other choice. It's honestly a horrifying prospect that Debbie may have been suffering in silence at the hands of Danita and Kurt. Her father and friends said they'd hoped she would have told them the truth if she was indeed unhappy and being mistreated. But the whole country was going through a really tough time at that point. And maybe Debbie just didn't want to add to anyone else's troubles. We regularly hear about missing persons cases being botched by the SAPS, 
But really, this case is an excellent example of stellar work by the Broncos Brate branch. If Warrant Officer Tuerson had not pushed for more information when she smelled a rat, there's a very good possibility the Van Rains would have gotten away with this. In fact, I think that they had banked on the SAPS not doing their jobs and they'd gone out of their way to make it even more difficult for them to do so by reporting the case at 1.30am rather than just going in during normal office hours. It may sound a little far-fetched, but I think this was done on purpose because the couple believed whoever was on duty at that time would be less likely to take a proper report and perhaps the docket wouldn't even find its way to an investigating officer in the morning. Honestly, I'd put nothing past these two. Some of Debbie's friends believe that Danita had planned this from the moment she saw Debbie's Facebook post. Even though she hadn't known about the policy at that time, she knew her sister had worked hard throughout her life, and she would be able to siphon off a lot of what she did have before her impending death from cancer. And it definitely seems that once she did discover there was a policy involved, Denita was not willing to wait for cancer to do the job. Debbie's father and his wife attended the court proceedings and took possession of her remains when the SAPS released them. Her friends were sad to hear that no service would be held in Debbie's memory, but they respected her family's wishes and remembered her in their own ways. They just hoped that their friend had not suffered in her death, although the circumstances seemed to say otherwise. Debbie Fenter may have been battling stage 4 cancer, for which the prognosis was not good but she was making the most of every single day of her life. She'd expressed a deep desire to live to anyone who would listen. Once she'd come to terms with the fact that cancer was likely going to overwhelm her, she set her mind on spending her last days with family. Thirty years before, Debbie Fenter had tried her very best to save her little sister, from having to go into the foster care system. As a 20-year-old, she'd worked her fingers to the bone to try and provide for a 7-year-old child who'd lost her mother. And even though she'd had to admit she couldn't keep that up, throughout Denita's life, Debbie had done her best to be there for her. Denita, though, clearly did not have a reciprocal level of care for her sister. Instead, she saw her first as a source of drugs and secondly as a source of cash and nothing more. This murder and the details of it are so incredibly cold-blooded. How do you look in the eyes of your sick sister who's in great pain and now terrible fear, and tie her frail wrists behind her back and place a plastic bag over her head, tying it as tightly as you can so that she has absolutely no hope of survival. And then just dispose of her like rubbish in a field, burning her body in the hopes that your revolting crime will be covered up. It's honestly so sickening. Debbie trusted Denita quite literally with her life. Maybe if lockdown hadn't happened and she'd had more time to think about the decision, she would have chosen differently. But I can't imagine the horror of her realising, perhaps long before the day of her death, that her little sister was not who she thought she was, and she was trapped in a very dangerous situation. The love expressed toward Debbie on her Facebook page is heartwarming, and it speaks 
to the character of the woman who Denita and Gert murdered. She'd formed strong bonds with so many people and was fondly remembered as someone who was independent, strong and always willing to help others. After acknowledging that cancer was accelerating her demise, Debbie wished only to be able to use her last months or years to continue to enjoy the beautiful relationships she'd forged in her life. And then when it was time, she could slip away, surrounded by loved ones, a small smile on her lips in remembrance of a life well lived. Instead, her last moments and those final months or years were ripped away from her by the person she never would have dreamed could be the vicious monster she truly was. Debbie Fenter, rest gently. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.